Okay, everyone, thanks for joining. We'll get started now. So welcome to the University of Texas Energy Symposium for today, February 8th, uh, 2022. I'm Carrie King, Assistant Director and Research Scientist at the Energy Institute. Uh, and before I more formally introduce today's speaker, I will point out the speaker for next week will be a local here at University of Texas at Austin, a relatively new professor, Sergio Castellanos. will talk about his work exploring inequities in energy and transportation systems in the United States and Mexico. But today, uh, it's our pleasure to have Stephen Otto from uh, ISO New England. He's an economist there, uh, and he's going to speak to us about uh, some relevant issues that they're dealing with, introduction to ISO New England and resource capacity accreditation. So just a little bit of background on his talk. Uh, it'll give us a background on New England ISO, uh, notions of its forward capacity market and the forward capacity auctions, which is kind of his specialty, and uh, what they're doing to uh, figure out how to change their markets or augment them to incorporate more intermittent wind and solar resources and a lower carbon grid. So we'll learn how those things might be different than say here in Texas or other ISOs in the United States. Uh, so he's uh, an economist in the market development department at ISO New England. And he got his PhD in 2018 from Cornell, uh, thinking about auction theory and behavioral economics. So certainly applicable for electric systems uh, and electricity markets operations. Uh, and so he's worked on energy and capacity market projects and understanding of the uh, implications of opportunity costs, uh, day ahead ancillary service products, uh, essentially uh, everything that economists need to think about to help us run uh, the electric grid. So with that said, I'm now going to hand it over to Stephen and I will remind everyone that they can ask questions at any time. He'll take questions during the talk. Uh, please submit your questions using the Q&A feature of Zoom and I'll try to interject and he'll try to stop a few times to, to open up for questions. So please submit questions at any time. And of course, we'll, we'll save whatever is there till the end as well. Uh, so with that being said, I will now hand it over to Stephen. The uh, floor is yours. All right, thanks, Kerry. Uh, can you hear me? I do. Uh, the screen looks good. Go All ahead. right, perfect. So as Kerry said, uh, my name is Stephen Otto. Um, I'm an economist at uh, ISO New England, and I've been here uh, for about uh, three and a half years. Today, um, I'm going to give a relatively brief overview of ISO New England, uh, what we do, what our motivation is, um, the types of markets that we oversee. And then I'll um, talk a little bit about where ISO New England is right now and what kind of issues we're considering. And then I'll focus in uh, specifically on one of our markets, the forward capacity market, um, which is a uh, a uh, market that kind of procures capacity uh, three years in advance uh, of a given year to ensure um, uh, certain standards of uh, reliability in the electric system. Um, I'll talk about that for a little bit. It's a little different than what many of you are probably used to um, being from Texas where um, you, know, you have an energy only market. And so we'll talk a little bit about that distinction as well. And then I will um, I'll focus in on one particular issue uh, with the forward capacity market that uh, the ISO is currently working on. and um, and then, uh, yeah, I'll close. And um, as a note throughout the presentation, um, please feel free to um, stop to ask me questions at any time. Um, I'm not an expert at Zoom. We use uh, WebEx at the ISO. So I'm not sure if I'll be able to see any chat messages that you have. Um, but uh, I'll also stop periodically for questions um, uh, to make sure that we're all, we're all on the same page. So um, like I said, it's a basic overview of where we're going to go with the presentation. Um, a little bit about ISO New England. You can see here uh, a map of the United States and a little bit of Canada. And up in this corner here, let's see if my laser pointer functionality is working, we have uh, the New England ISO. So um, there are multiple uh, ISOs and RTOs uh, throughout the United States. Um, the, the word or the acronym ISO stands for Independent Systems Operator. And uh, Kind of a, a term for a nonprofit organization that um, oversees and administers um, the various uh, electricity and energy markets within a given region. Um, and, uh, you know, usually the ISOs are also operating the uh, electricity grid. They're um, kind of, uh, well, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, so we have ISO New England, which is one of the smaller ISOs. 
Um, we also have uh, a few single state ISOs. Um, there's the New York ISO and uh, there's uh, ERCA, which I'm sure you're all uh, familiar with. And then there's the California ISO. And then we have uh, some uh, multi-state spanning uh, ISOs. We have SPP and then the Mid-Continent ISO and uh, the largest of them all um, uh, is uh, DJM. So, okay, what is ISO New England's mission and what's our vision for the future? So I'll just read a little bit uh, to you here. Uh, our mission uh, is that through collaboration and innovation, ISO New England plans the transmission system, we administer the region's wholesale markets, and we operate the power system to ensure reliable and uh, competitively priced wholesale electricity. And where we're going, well, we want to harness the power of market competition and advanced technologies to reliably plan and operate the grid, specifically as the region uh, transitions to a uh, cleaner, uh, cleaner energy uh, system. So New England has been administering uh, the markets, or ISO New England has been administering the markets in, in the region for about uh, two decades. Um, uh, some of you may know that a, a couple decades ago, there was a pretty big restructuring in uh, the electricity world in the United States, where a lot of the old uh, vertically integrated utility companies were broken up so that the resources would competitively compete to, um, to sell power. Uh, the ISO itself is a nonprofit organization. It's probably easiest to think of it as something of a hybrid or a crossover or an intersection between a, a government agency and a, a private company. Um, we don't have a profit motive. We're strictly a nonprofit organization, but we're also not a government agency. Um, we do um, report to, uh, to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC. They're our, uh, our regulator. Um, and we also were the reliability coordinator for uh, New England. Uh, so we also report to um, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation. As I said, um, the ISO is uh, strictly independent of companies in the marketplace. Um, and, you know, well, what does that mean in practice? So my, my story is, uh, you know, first, um, as an employee of the ISO, uh, we're not allowed to own any you know, stocks, for example, uh, uh, and participants in, in our electricity markets to ensure that we don't have um, you know, uh, a motive to improve the profits of one company over another. Um, my personal story is when I, when I started the ISO three and a half years ago, my wife was uh, um, an uh, employee of National Grid, which is a large um, uh, regulated utility in, in New England. Um, and this, of course, potentially represented a problem. So uh, in my hiring process, uh, my wife and I had to sign various documents that you know, ensured that certain things would or would not be discussed. Um, uh, fortunately for us, it was only a temporary problem. My wife uh, herself now works at the ISO, and so um, that, that conflict has, has gone away. But um, the, we're very, we're very um, uh, cognizant of ensuring our independence to make sure that we're doing the best job that we can to um, uh, to you know, uh, set and administer the, uh, the wholesale electricity markets uh, in New England. So I've kind of hinted at three critical roles that the ISO plays um, in, in New England's electricity markets. The first is the actual operation of the grid. Um, so we have a control room uh, at our main facility, and here's a, here's a picture of it right here. And the people in this picture are the operators in that control room. And I like to think of this control room as kind of like a NASA style uh, control room where, you know, you can see um, the individual resources and, 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 and uh, the grid essentially represented up there on that massive screen, right? And the operator's job is to, on a minute to minute basis, you know, tell power plants to turn on or off or increase or decrease uh, their production. As uh, many of you probably know, uh, the electricity market and electricity in general is, is kind of very specific. We have to ensure at any given moment that supply and demand uh, of, of electricity are kept um, uh, you know, uh, equal to each other. If there is an imbalance, uh, that could lead to serious harm to um, you know, the critical infrastructure that um, allows the grid to operate. Um, and so uh, the operators uh, ensure that that balance is, is maintained. Um, and this is a, a really critical job. Uh, it's, I, I work in the same building as, uh, as 
this room. I frequently pass this room, but I have never been uh, inside of it. Uh, you have to have a, a higher security clearance than, um, than I have to be, to be allowed into the control room. There are various security things that I probably shouldn't go into detail about uh, that protect this control room. And our building in general itself is protected by you know, armed police officers every hour um, of the day. If, God forbid, something did happen to the control room, we have an entire backup facility with an entire backup control room that can take over operation of New England's grid uh, you know, at a moment's notice. Um, and then we have contingencies even beyond that to ensure that uh, the grid can continue to operate uh, reliability, so, uh, reli reliably so that we can keep uh, the lights on for everybody. So that's our first critical role. Our second is to design, run, and oversee the markets where wholesale electricity is bought and sold. And that's where, uh, you know, myself and my department do a lot of our work. Um, we have a few uh, markets um, that ISO New England oversees. We have an energy market like Texas, uh, both day ahead and uh, real time. So we're buying, we're overseeing the purchase and sale of electricity every five minutes. Um, we also have uh, the forward capacity market, which I'll talk about um, in greater detail um, later on in this presentation. And then we have markets for what we call ancillary services, which are um, much smaller markets that, that I, won't, I won't talk about in great detail. Our final function is uh, system planning. So we study and analyze um, and forecast uh, what we think the uh, demands on um, uh, the New England system are going to be over the next 10 years to ensure that, you know, um, we we are prepared for uh, increases in um, electricity demand, for example, um, uh, over that time horizon. Okay, so I imagine many people listening to this right now are uh, economists or have, a, have had economics training, so I won't spend a lot of time talking about why competitive markets uh, are good, uh, broadly speaking, and why we think um, that they're, they're well suited for um, the, the energy industry. Um, but there's kind of three high level reasons that, that we would cite. The first is that competition among um, you know, wholesale electricity buyers and sellers uh, you know, reduces costs uh, over time and ensures that there's um, no rent seeking like we might uh, observe um, in markets that have, say, uh, uh, you know, market power, um, uh, for example. Competitive markets also um, yield efficiency and transparency in terms of prices, which helps to uh, spur innovation um, uh, and investment in new technologies, um, which is also good. One of the more compelling reasons for having competitive markets, in my, in my opinion, is how uh, the markets handle investment risk. Um, and so to, to describe that in a little bit more detail. Um, I'll, I'll tell a, a short story here. Um, in 2011, um, there was a large um, uh, coal fire power plant in uh, Massachusetts uh, called Brayton Point. Um, and the uh, plant needed to, if it was going to continue operation, uh, to invest a substantial sum of money, um, I think it was $600 million, into um, uh, improvements to the plant to meet the various environmental standards that were being imposed. Um, the owner of the plant uh, determined that that investment was worthwhile. Uh, um, and so they invested that money um, and built uh, two uh, enormous cooling towers. Um, eight years later, um, this happened. I don't think you guys are gonna get audio on this, but it's the video is good too. Six hundred million dollars. Um, I think those things were. I forget how tall they were. Really big. You'll get a. You'll get a, another vantage point here in a second. You can see down here a door in reference. Right. Oh, geez, I messed it up here. Bottom right corner, that's the that's a, the door compared to the size of these towers. Huge. And then just one more. I like to watch things blow up, so easily amused perhaps, but 
this is my favorite part coming up here in a second because then we reverse time and they go back up again. But in any case, uh, in a market without um, competitive markets, uh, say a uh, vertically integrated utility structure, uh, if um, the utility decided to invest the money into building the, uh, those cooling towers, and it turns out that those cooling towers were not a sound investment, uh, who bears the responsibility for paying off that money? Any, th any thoughts on that? I'll guess it's just the investors. This is Carrie. <laughs> so in a in a vertically integrated utility structure. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. So say <laughs> where where um, where uh, a company uh, takes its it, it takes its costs and then uses those in a rate case to determine how much uh, you know they can charge for say electricity. The costs of those cooling towers would actually be paid for eventually by ratepayers themselves in the region. And so another big example of this is, for example, the, uh, the Vogel nuclear plant, um, which I think the current cost estimate right now is close to $30 billion, which, um, you know, I think ISO New England's markets last in 2020 traded about, oh, it's right here, traded about $5.7 billion. So that's all the value of all of the wholesale electricity markets in all of New England in 2020 was $5.7 billion. And the, the price of the Vogel plant is, is going to be closer to $30 billion. So what happens when you know you have cost overruns in a vertically integrated utility structure, or when you make an investment that ends up, you know, after the fact, perhaps not being a good one? Those costs get borne by consumers, by the citizens and residents of those areas that are buying electricity, and those costs are borne through by by increased electricity prices. Um, in the competitive markets, though, uh, what happens is. If a company makes a really, really bad investment or, you know, uh, sees their project is not economically viable, they go bankrupt and the consumers are largely shielded from uh, the kind of the financial consequences of, of those decisions. That's one of the one of the main reasons why um, why implementing uh, the market structures a couple decades ago um, can be seen as being beneficial to um, to consumers of electricity in the areas where those reforms were implemented. I should note that many regions still have, um, you know, old school style uh, vertically integrated utility structures. If we were to go back to that map earlier on, you'll see not all of the country is, is being governed by an ISO and RTO, their electricity markets. And so in, in those areas, um, uh, a different structure is being used where there's, you know, not the competitive trade of, of wholesale electricity. So um, Moving on here, and I think I'll get to a good point to stop and take some questions in just a second, but um, you can see how much money is being traded in New England's electricity markets, you know, over the last 13 years or so. Um, for the most part, the energy markets have generally dominated in terms of uh, the, the total amount of money. So the pr price of electricity, the total quantity of electricity sold used to dwarf the amount of money that was traded in the capacity market and through ancillary services. But over time, um, and we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail in a moment, um, the resource mix in New England has shifted away from uh, coal and, and um, oil-fired power plants to natural gas, which is cheaper. And so energy prices have generally decreased. Um, and as they have done so, uh, the money that resources need to be paid in the capacity market has increased, and so we've seen a little bit of an offset there. Um, this is maybe a little different uh, for 2022. We'll see. Um, we've seen pretty high, uh, like much of the rest of the world, uh, seen pretty high energy prices, um, particularly in, in the winter time. Um, and natural gas prices in particular are quite high, which has led to um, uh, to some pretty high um, uh, electricity prices. So let me just stop here for a moment and, and see if there are any questions or points of clarification people would like to ask before I talk a little bit about the capacity market. Yeah, there's one question here, which I think maybe the rest of your presentation might <clears throat> go towards, which is just talking about efficiency, I suppose, perhaps low understanding the costs of 
yeah, what are the importance of technologies and things you're working on to in integrate renewables and what's the role of microgrids and smart grids for that? So maybe you'll touch on some of that later. I, I don't know, or you can address it now. I, I probably won't touch on microgrids or smart grids, but I will definitely touch on the projects that the ISO is, is undertaking now and will be undertaking that will attempt to, you know, facilitate the um, the transition to um, to a resource mix that is comprised more of, of clean energy resources. Any other questions, or should I? Uh, should I we don't have any other on? open questions, so yeah, just go ahead. Okay. Thanks, Carrie. Okay, so the capacity market. Um, Essentially, so well, let me let me take a step back. Actually, so in in Texas, um, you guys have what is called an energy only market, which means there functionally is no uh, forward reliability market. And um, the way that you incent um, resources to enter the market is you have really really high prices uh, when you have reserve shortages, i.e., when you know the system is either forced to shed load or is close to the point where uh, load shedding will occur. Um, if you're not familiar with the term load shed, this is you know rolling blackouts essentially, um, where the uh, operator has to um, kind of enforce, cut off portions of the grid from electric power to ensure that the physical um, you know, requirements of keeping the, the grid in balance uh, are maintained. Um, and so, Texas has really, really high energy prices, and we saw some of those really high energy prices about a year ago um, uh, when conditions are really tight. Um, there's That's one way of kind of making sure that um, uh, you have enough resources in your system to ensure that demand is met by supply. Um, the core issue here is that if you think about a power system, right, on most days, you're not going to need every power plant um, in your system because, you know, most days uh, demand is not close to what it is on peak days, right? So, you know, on some days in New England, for example, you know, uh, we'll observe a peak load of, you know, say 15,000 megawatts, whereas on others it could be, you know, in the mid 20s, right? Um, and so sometimes you you have power plants that only really need to be turned on in peak conditions. But if a power plant is only being turned on in peak conditions, then it's probably not going to be making very much money just through energy prices, right? So you have to find a way to ensure that those peaking plants uh, get enough money. Um, otherwise, they won't enter the market or they'll leave the market, and then you're not going to have enough power plants to um, to ensure that the lights stay on when when you're in peak conditions. Um, and this is called the missing money problem. Um, and uh, ERCOT um, has really, really high electricity prices when they've kind of set the prices intentionally very high using um, reserve pricing when uh, there's uh, reserve shortages, when they're getting close to the point where they're gonna have to shed load. And that additional money allows the peaking plants to stay in business. Um, another way of doing this is to have a forward capacity market where you uh, essentially procure the resources that you think you're going to need three years in advance of a given year, um, and then you pay those resources uh, to be around to provide energy when you think that you're going to need it. And um, so the advantage of using a forward capacity market is that you have a competitive market structure where resources can compete against each other to determine who can most cost effectively uh, be around to provide energy uh, when we need it. So um, some of you have probably studied optimization theory um, to some degree, you know, even if it's just thinking about, you know, like Lagrange multipliers, for example. But the FCM is this truly enormously complex optimization problem, right? We have hundreds of potential resources all, all you know, submitting offers in our forward auction to determine who is going to be the resources that are going to provide the reliability and the energy that we need um, in the delivery year. Um, and the, uh, the objective function for that optimization problem is to minimize the total costs uh, of procuring those resources subject to the constraint that we have enough resources uh, to keep the lights on. 
And we have the standard called the one day in 10 years standard, which essentially says that in the forward market, we're going to have to procure enough resources to ensure that we don't uh, disconnect consumer load more than one day in, in, in 10 years. And um, I'll note that the ISO has not shed load uh, in decades. Um, this is an incredibly complex optimization problem to solve, and we conduct the forward capacity auctions using a descending clock auction for, for those of you who studied, um, studied auction theory. Um, so, okay, so we're, thinking about, we're thinking about this giant pool of potential resources that we could uh, procure in advance to ensure that we have uh, enough capacity uh, when we need it to produce power, right? So a question to think about, and that we'll get we'll round back to in a little bit, is do all of the resources provide the same contribution to reliability per, let's say, megawatt of nameplate installed capacity, right? So does a 100 megawatt solar farm provide the same contribution to reliability as a 100 megawatt battery storage resource or a 100 megawatt natural gas fired power plant? And if the answer is no, how should we measure and compare those contributions? And how should we do so as part of this optimization problem to ensure that the resource mix that we're procuring is going to be, you know, optimal and least cost? Okay, so let's talk about the most recent FCA. So, and uh, we're, we're conducting another FCA this week. The one that happened a year before this one. Um, attracted and retained resources uh, to ensure reliability in 2024-2025. Um, we the auction concluded with commitments of 34,000 and change of capacity megawatts of capacity to be available during uh, that capacity commitment period. Um, one of the major things to note for the first time we saw a lot of battery resources clear 600 megawatts um, was a lot of uh, new um, battery capability that cleared in the market. We also saw uh, a lot of energy efficiency. Um, New England uh, really kind of leads the way in, in uh, energy efficiency investments um, uh, in the United States. And we also saw um, demand resources um, clear. And another big feature of New England's markets is, uh, you know, we were right next to uh, Quebec um, and they have a lot of um, relatively cheap hydropower up in Quebec and not as much load as say uh, we do in like, the Boston area. And so we buy a lot of imports uh, from, uh, from Quebec, um, and, but we also uh, procure imports. Uh, we import power from, from New York and New Brunswick as well. Okay, so let's get to the stuff that I think all of you will find particularly interesting. So this, this I think this chart's really quite stunning. It shows just how dramatic the evolution in um, and the resource mix in New England has been over the last, you know, 20 some odd years. Uh, when the competitive markets were first introduced to New England, we had about the same number of nuclear plants. We've seen some retirements, um, but, uh, you know, most of the energy um, back then was, uh, back in, 20, in 2000, was produced from nuclear power plants, or a plurality of the energy was produced from, from nuclear power plants, and a similar quantity of energy is being produced from them today. But look at what's happened to the, the oil and the coal uh, uh, fired um, energy. It's cratered. And uh, as I mentioned uh, before, this might be a little different in 20, uh, 2022 um, because we've seen natural gas prices that are so high that um, uh, we've seen a lot of, uh, of our uh, energy production come from oil plants um, in, in January. I think something on the order of 13% of the energy produced in January was from uh, power plants that were using um, oil, uh, some, something in that um, you know, general area. Um, and so um, it'll maybe a little different for 2022, just because of how, how cold it's been and how high the natural gas prices have been. But we've seen a, a huge number of retirements. Uh, at this point, I think we have you know, one medium large sized coal power plant and then maybe one or two small ones left in New England. But I think otherwise all of the coal resources have retired. Um, we've seen a lot of retirements from the oil fleet as well. And obviously here, an absolute explosion in the total quantity of energy being um, produced by uh, natural gas um, uh, power plants. 
And, you know, it doesn't look like that big of a change, but we have seen about a 50% increase in the total amount of energy um, produced by um, renewable resources um, in the last 20 years or so. And I think, you know, we'll get to this in a little bit more detail in a second, but uh, that that change is likely to accelerate um, over over the coming decades uh, for a variety of reasons. So, just to note here, um, as a result of the kind of uh, the movement of the resource mix away from coal and oil and towards natural gas, we've seen pretty large decreases in various air pollutants over that 20-year time frame. You know, almost a 50% decrease in carbon dioxide. And, and, you know, pretty massive decreases in uh, NOx and SOx as well. Um, so, I one, as I one mentioned... question relevant to oh, the last slide yeah, is, please. do you have an idea of the previous one, maybe on the generation mix change, do you have an idea of how much, how many gas plants have oil backup or what level of capacity or duration that is? Yes, good question. Um, probably don't want to speak off the top of my head. There's a, a I will say, a substantial portion of the gas fleet, um, not, perhaps not more than half, but a substantial portion does have uh, dual fuel, what we call dual fuel capabilities. The, um, the I think the storage uh, available, uh, the storage of oil available to those uh, plants, uh, as we economists would say, is quite heterogeneous. Um, so some of them have you know, storage that could last for maybe days, while others um, uh, not quite so long. Um, but I don't want to give you any any hard figures that I would just kind of be pulling out of a hat. So I'll say that it does exist, um, and uh, it's certainly something that we at the ISO, you know, uh, are currently relying on to ensure that um, you know we uh, their system reliability can be kept in place when um, you know conditions are going to be uh, pretty tight in the winter. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, so as I said, there's reason to think that there's gonna be a pretty big increase in the you know, quantity of energy produced by renewable uh, or intermittent resources over the next few decades. And the reason why is a lot of the New England states have implemented you know, statutory requirements that dictate how much of the energy that's consumed in their state must be produced from you know, zero carbon resources. And these goals are you know, very ambitious. Um, Massachusetts has a net zero goal by 2050. Um, Vermont has a 90% renewable energy requirement by 2050. Um, Maine has a 100% renewable energy requirement by 2050. Um, you know, these huge, huge numbers here, right? Um, and to look at this a little bit more graphically, this is the uh, renewable portfolio standards uh, for the different New England states. Um, so, you know, we're talking about here we are here, and here's where we're going to be in, in 20 years. And even really in, in, you know, at this point, 2022, eight years from now, um, this is what the, the renewable portfolio uh, standards are going to be for, for the New England states. So um, to meet these statutory requirements, you know, more uh, wind farms have to be built, more solar farms have to be built um, uh, in order to meet the, the requirements set forth by the state legislatures. So um, indicative of that, we can take a look at the uh, current proposed resources um, in New England. So. This is just kind of a pie chart here of all of the different you know, resources that are currently proposed uh, and what technology type they are. Let me just state that you know, not every resource that's been proposed will be constructed. In fact, many will not. Um, but you can see you know, something like, oh geez, all, over 95% of the proposed resources in, in megawatt terms are going to be um, wind, solar, or battery storage. Um, you know, there's right now, um, uh, you know, ground is, well, I say ground, but uh, that's a little nebulous with offshore wind. Uh, they are construction on, on vineyard wind uh, is, is um, you know, set to begin uh, in earnest after uh, the Biden administration approved the last permits that were necessary. I know Massachusetts um, just in the last year or so has um, started a contract for additional um, 
offshore wind farms, uh, Connecticut and Rhode Island both have um, interest, I think, in that as well, um, and, and, and as indicated by you know uh, the proposed resources, uh, uh, offshore wind resources down here. Um, and and there's all, there is also likely to be uh, some increase in the quantity of, of solar resources around the system. And we've already started to see increases in uh, the number of battery storage resources um, uh, in the resource mix. So, you know, uh, big changes to the resource mix are on their way, um, the message I have here. And um, so there's these, these pretty ambitious goals. Um, there's big changes that we anticipate to happen. And uh, the ISO is, um, you know, committed to um, uh, working with stakeholders to support this transition um, to make sure that um, in the, you know, in the coming decades, uh, to ensure that the power system can transform the resources it currently uses, um, uh, and also adapt the transmission system and wholesale markets, um, as consumer demand grows, uh, from the decarbonation, big carbonization of other sectors. And specifically what I mean there is, it's not just that there's, um, you know, increasing demands from the states for, uh, clean energy. It's also that, uh, we're seeing, um, you know, electrification of uh, heating, for example, whereas most residential homes in New England right now are heated with natural gas. Uh, you know, many homes may eventually be heated by heat pumps. Um, most cars are, you know, powered by gasoline, and eventually uh, uh, those that, that may be overtaken by electric vehicles. And so that's all going to impact, um, uh, you know, the quantity of resources that we need at the grid level to ensure that we could continue to produce energy that will be uh, necessary to, to, to meet that demand. And so um, this is going to be a monumental undertaking. It's going to be a very, very exciting couple of decades uh, at the ISO and really in many places. Um, and so there's going to be many projects uh, that are going to reflect this commitment. And I'm actually going to kind of talk about uh, one of those projects today. Um, so let me just stop here, though, because that was a lot of material and I imagine some of it was, was of pretty big interest to, to some of you. So let me stop for questions if you have any. All uh, right. There's a, there's a couple of questions sort of on the definition of the renewable or clean energy standards of the states, which you, yeah, I guess you may or may not know about why they're one or the other, like New Hampshire has a low renewable requirement. And one here kind of specific on carbon capture and storage, if you know how they're, that's treated in any of these. Okay. Well, let me try the first question first. Um, I think there is, um, you know, heterogeneity amongst the states about, about what they want to do in terms of, of clean energy. Um, and um, some of the states have been uh, very ambitious in this regard, um, like, uh, you know, Massachusetts, um, and others um, have just set their goals differently, I guess is what I would say. Um, and so uh, some of the some of those goals, I think, are kind of the goals are some, if I recall correctly, are non-binding. Some of those that we listed, though, are strictly binding, like the um, the renewable portfolio standards and things like that. Those are statutory requirements um, uh, that the states uh, have to meet. And so um, it'll be interesting to see, you know, um, both as someone directly kind of involved in, in some of these processes, but also as a resident of, um, of, of New England, you know, how, how all of this evolves over the next um, eight to 10 years or, and beyond. Um, I, the second question was on carbon capture and storage, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, that's a good question. I don't, I don't think we currently have any of those resources in the resource mix. I could be wrong but I don't think we currently have those resources. As, as the technology becomes you know, economically viable, um, we would have to you know, adapt and uh, determine what rules changes would be necessary um, uh, uh, to ensure that those resources could, could be competitively um, in, in non-markets. Any other questions? Uh, I think you're about to get into how renewables are treated in capacity here in the next part. So yeah. uh, probably a push that one. There's one, here, Good. there's one here about the energy mix. You know, you showed change from 2000 to 2020. 
uh, I think I don't even know this acronym. So the question, how important is the great drop in the LRIC of renewables? I don't know if they... I don't know if that means it's a levelized cost and it got mistyped or, or what, but I, <laughs> I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, let's delay the answer to that question it. now. Maybe if they could um, restate the question um, and then right. I'll, I can come loop back around to that maybe as we get yeah. closer to the end of the presentation. Yeah. Um, and the other one here, which you may be getting to, so I, you can go ahead is, uh, you know, how to think about reliability of gas supply, which I think you, you also thinking about. So oh, but. <laughs> the question too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah go All ahead. right. Um, I will all forge ahead then. So, okay. So I kind of set up that question before and then clearly, um, you know, there's some thought being given, uh, given to it uh, amongst um, all of you. So how do we measure resources contributions to reliability? How should we measure resources contributions to reliability? So recall that the FCM is this enormously complex optimization problem, right? Where minimizing the cost of procuring resources subject to our reliability constraints. So in order to send the correct investment signals, resources should be uh, compensated based on their contribution to reliability, right? Resources that contribute more to reliability should be paid more, um, and resources that contribute less should be paid less. Uh, you know, somewhat intuitive result there. Speaking very generally, I'm going to emphasize that very there because the uh, forward capacity market um, is not something that could possibly be, you know, uh, explained in great detail uh, in a 45 minute seminar, but each resource is paid. They have a qualified capacity value um, and they're paid uh, however much of that that clears times the FCA's capacity clearing price. And they receive that as revenue in the capacity market. And so QC qualified capacity is set differently to, currently depending on whether you're a conventional generator or an intermittent resource. So if you're a conventional generator, like a natural gas power plant or a nuclear power plant or something like that, uh, QC is their maximum output capability, uh, adjusted for a couple of things, but I'll gloss over that for right now. And then for intermittent resources, we have kind of a more heuristic method where we um, determine their QC by setting it to their average output uh, in peak hours. Um, so, you know, the solar and wind QC, while 100, you know, 100 megawatt natural gas plants might have a QC of close to 100 megawatts, you know, solar and wind resources would have QCs far lower, you know, like the 15 to 30 megawatt range uh, using the current rules. So, okay, problems with the current accreditation methods. Well, these methods actually work perfectly adequately for many years when uh, the resource mix consisted primarily of so-called conventional resources, right? When intermittent resources constituted only a very small portion of the resource mix, um, these heuristic approximations were kind of close enough, right? Uh, there wasn't, there was, wasn't going to have a substantial impact on, um, on uh, system efficiency. Um, but we, looking ahead into the future a little bit, right? Given the, um, uh, the ambitious state goals, given what's in the queue, um, it seems that that's just an assumption that's not going to be the case going forward. That, you know, given that this accreditation process was really, you know, and really in some ways the entire FCA was designed with traditional generators in mind, we're going to have to make some changes to, um, uh, to account for the increasing penetration of renewable resources in New England resource mix. Okay. So why does the current method of measuring the reliability contributions of a solar resource not work? Or at least why will we think it might not work eventually? So imagine that we have different levels of um, solar penetration in the system, right? And I think, I think this chart is actually pulled from a presentation on California. So it's not strictly applicable to, um, uh, to New England per se, but the idea is, uh, as we see the quantity of solar capacity in the system increase, um, what ends up happening, and particularly with behind the meter solar, right? Behind the meter solar essentially decreases the demand for electricity, um, right? Uh, during sunlight hours, and doing so shifts the peak uh, of. Um, uh, peak electricity demand to hours 
that are later and later in the day, eventually to hours where the sun doesn't shine. Um, okay, so if we're seeing that kind of change where all of the uh, hours that we're most concerned about for you know having load shedding or having reserve shortages, generally hours we're concerned about from a perspective of reliability, if those hours are shifting from you know the middle of the middle to late afternoon to seven or eight p.m., what is the reliability value of a solar resource in such a system? Well, if you're expecting your reliability events to occur when the sun's going to be down, it's obviously going to have an impact on the marginal contribution to reliability of the next megawatt of solar resources that you install in the system. And right now, we don't reflect this kind of decreasing reliability returns within resource types. Uh, we don't reflect that kind of interaction uh, in the way that we do capacity accreditation. Okay. So, I wish I had all the answers for you. We're, we're working on it, we're thinking about it. We're gonna have a stakeholder process on this. Um, where you know we're gonna the way that the ISO kind of functions is um, often uh, we either make a proposal or FERC tells us we have to make a proposal and uh, we'll go with the stakeholders and we'll we'll work with uh, the various stakeholders in New England you know the owners of the uh, the resources the the states the utility companies the consumer representatives etc to come up with a proposal to change the current market structure um, to um, reflect you know, things that need to be done to reflect uh, issues or potential issues with our current rules. Um, but there's still a lot of open questions about you know, how this should be handled. Um, so one such question is, uh, should we be compensating resources based on their total contribution to system reliability uh, or their contribution at the margin? Um, and different uh, ISOs have made different choices here. You know, we're not the only ISO that's uh, struggling with this issue right now. Um, and so there's no uniform consensus on what the right answer to this question is. So to give you an idea about how this might matter, let's assume we are back in a, in a world like this, right? Where our solar penetration is such that the peak hours are now after the sun has set, right? Under a marginal reliability approach, the reliability contribution of these resources might be close to zero. Whereas under an average reliability approach, the contribution might be larger because it will account for the reliability contributions that are accrued by the first uh, you know, few gigawatts of solar and not just the last little bit. So that's the crux of that question, right? As here's another question, which is you know, really important for New England. How should we measure the contribution of gas only generators when New England has a constrained gas pipeline? So, you know, Texas isn't the only region that's worried about um, the reliability of the power system in the winter. The ISO in New England is also, it's something that's certainly, you know, on our radar. Our issues are a little, uh, are slightly different than, um, than what, what's, what's going on in Texas. Our problem is that a lot of our system, as you in the previous slides, uh, a lot of our energy comes from natural gas fired power plants. Um, and we import all of that natural gas in, you know, in, from three different pipelines that generally go through other places that also need natural gas to um, you know, power their power plants and uh, to, to keep their lights on. And um, the natural gas, so we're, we're at the end of the line, right? We're the last people who get to draw gas from, from those pipelines. So that's kind of concern one. Concern two is that the, um, the residential heating and the commercial heating um, in New England has priority access to the gas on the pipelines so that when it gets really cold, the demands on the gas pipeline from residential and commercial heating are quite high and it limits the quantity of gas that the power plants can pull um, uh, from the pipelines. So, how should we measure the contribution of gas only generators when New England has a constrained gas pipeline? Um, we're working on it, I guess is what I would say. It's a big question um, and we're, we're thinking about that. Um, another open question is, 
larger resources may see decreases in their reliability contributions. So why is that? Um, well, if we think about one of the hours that we're most likely to see strain in terms of how much uh, available um, energy we have, or how strain in terms of our ability to ensure that we meet demand with uh, energy supply. Well, those hours are likely to be the ones where, or can be more likely to be the ones where our largest resources have gone offline, right? If we have a, a 2000 megawatt power plant, whether it's on or not is going to be correlated with whether or not uh, there's, um, you know, uh, 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 scarcity events. And so as a result, larger power plants or larger resources may see decreases in their, in their reliability contributions. Um, another open question is, well, reliability contributions could just shift significantly from year to year. Right now uh, in the FCA, um, your uh, contribution is pretty much set at your QC. There's some caveats to that that I won't go into, but essentially is pretty constant over time. But once we make it so that your reliability contributions are dependent on the rest of the resource mix, then year to year, the reliability contribution of your resource is going to shift significantly. So if you're thinking about building, uh, say, a solar resource or a natural gas resource or a wind farm or, or what have you, you, have, you'll, you may have to end up thinking about, well, what is the resource mix going to look like in five or 10 years? Because that's going to dictate, potentially, what my reliability contribution is and therefore what my compensation is going to be. How should resources manage that risk? Um, so as you can see, there's a lot of really big and important open questions um, in this area. And, um, and you know, we're, we're working on it and I'm looking forward to, um, to working on it with, uh, with the stakeholders as well as we, as we enter the stakeholder process. So I'm actually, I'm not quite over time, but probably I, I wanted to save a little bit more time for questions. So I'll just say the ISO is always looking for, you know, um, people who are interested in these problems who want to come work with us. And you can see, you know, we got, over here, markets development, that's my department. Um, my wife works in, in the market monitoring department. Um, we're always looking for, you know, uh, economists, analysts, um, electrical engineers, um, lawyers, um, people with experience in forecasting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I think the ISO is a great place to work. Hopefully I've convinced you that there's, you know, no uh, shortage of challenging and interesting problems that uh, we're going to need to work on uh, over the next couple of decades. And so, um, you know, uh, consider it. Uh, if it's something sounds like something you might be interested in, you can always reach out to me to talk to me about it as well. I'd be happy to happy to chat. And if you can't tell, I, you know, when you get me talking, sometimes it can be hard to get me to stop. So, um, always happy to talk more about these issues. Um, if you're interested in New England generally, we have this handy dandy little app that allows you to see what the various real time and day ahead prices are um, at any given time. It'll tell you what the current fuel mix is. Stephen, you've gone on mute. You've, we've lost your screen and you went to mute somehow. You, there was a little blip there. Oh, yes. I uh, don't hear you yet or see anything again. Still don't hear you or still on mute. Let me see if I can turn you off you mute. Try to hear me now. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Hear you. Okay. Don't see your screen, right. but go ahead. That's it. If, you have any, if you have any questions, uh, just, um, you know, let me know um, uh, now That's, or later, but I'm happy to yeah. take questions, sir. Uh, you addressed some of the questions. People are wondering about gas supply and capacity rating of renewables. So you're, you've, you've stated you're, you're on the case, I guess, and looking for people to, to help. So in that sense, that's good. Um, just one clarification thing you, you probably know here. What is the sort of normal peaking time of total generation in ISO New England? Here in Texas, we know it's usually summer afternoons, but then we have this winter, uh, <laughs> winter extreme heating in the morning, which potentially happens. So what about New England? Good question. Well, let's take a look at the ISO New England website right now, and it'll tell us what the peak hour is for today. Um, little uh, plug here. It looks like we're going to hit peak right at around uh, four. No, I'm sorry, uh, about six o'clock. 
and we'll hit about peak at about 17,000 megawatts, give or take. And now that'll be different in, you know, summer. Um, uh, it'll be different in in December. And um, you know, so a big part of the operators' jobs and the forecasters' jobs is to look at as much data as they have. You know, we have um, um, uh, data uh, from you know various uh, sources for you know weather, for example, weather forecasts, um, and they they use those profiles. They match them up to similar previous days to try to figure out what uh, load shape is going to look like on a given day. As you can imagine, the last two years has been pretty challenging for some of the forecasters trying to think, you know, there is no precedent for what, you know, especially in like April of 2020, there is no precedent for what a uh, Wednesday afternoon's load is supposed to look like when everyone is sitting in their homes, you know, on what is supposed to be a work day in the middle of April. And so, that was a challenge for them, but um, I think they, they pulled through pretty well. They did a good job. Right. Um, there's some questions here, which you may not know the answer to about renewable, you know, energy targets and these kinds of things of the New England states. And one is, you know, is there are penalties for not meeting the state targets? But maybe a question, if you don't know that relevant for you is, does ISO New England somehow influence by just the way it operates whether states are able to achieve their targets? Or would you, you know, in your auctions and capacities, would you predict, you know, potentially not pick certain resources and then it makes it less likely that a state somehow might influence their ability to meet their targets? So the good questions as to the exact penalty structure for the various, you know, um, uh, renewable portfolio standards. I'm not an expert in that, um, so I won't. Um, I can't give you any exact figures on on how that works. Um, uh, I do know that there there is some. Recalling from my days learning about this a couple of years ago, there is some penalty structure in place for for you know, uh, utility companies that fail to meet the standard. I don't remember off the top of my head exactly how it works, so I, I won't speak to that. Um, how do how does the ISO and its decisions impact the ability of the states to meet their clean energy objectives? Really good question. Um, I guess I would just say I'll just say that the ISO uh, wants to the ISO has its core responsibilities right, and you know we have to make sure we have to ensure reliability, we have to operate the grid, and we have to keep the markets competitive, and. The ISO is doing its best and is working along with the states and the stakeholders to ensure that we could, you know, aid in the transition to a resource mix that has greater quantities of clean energy while still respecting those um, kind of core uh, uh, institutional uh, uh, objectives. Right. There's a couple questions. Maybe this is, I don't know how much the terminology, you know, varies across. ISOs are, you know, ELCC or effective load carrying capacity in ERCOT, mm -hmm. and then you have QC, uh, uh, well, I, maybe I can't remember, you know, capacity qualification or, or what, it, what it was, qualified capacity. So one, so the sort of questions about these terms and are they applicable in general, but one here's good specific question is, is one more about exogenous factors like weather, uh, and one more about economic uh, contributions like gas, you're talking about gas, generators and what their their capacity contribution would be uh, dependent upon uh, gas supply. And um, so there's there have to be different, I mean, I guess you're, you're, you're open to all these. I guess the questions are just like, you know, you have to, do we have to use different methods to address, you know, gas mm -hmm. in this case, natural gas and renewables, different kinds of algorithms. Um, and, you know, is there anything more you can say about this sort of methods y'all are, are debating and what, what do you think is maybe good or another ISOs that you that you're aware of or good ideas or go ahead. These are such good questions, Carrie. Very, very getting into the weeds about how we're going uh, to model yeah. resources and things like that. Uh, just, yeah, yeah. We've got some knowledgeable folks. Good question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so average ELCC is um, uh, that stands for effective load carrying capability. And it's a way of measuring um, uh, resources contributions to reliability. And this is, I kind of mentioned in the presentation, there's, you know, you could do a total contributions approach or a marginal contributions approach, and um, the best, the average kind of falls closer into the category of the total contributions uh, side of things. Um, the as to okay, what are other ISOs doing? Um, 
let's see. I, you know, I, as you mentioned, there's uh, places are already implementing average ELCC. I believe some places are implementing it for some resources and not for others. Um, I believe the New York ISO has committed to a marginal approach as part of their recent MOPA filing, although the details on exactly how that will work are, um, are still to be determined. Um, I think uh, it is, you know, I think beneficial if whatever approach you take, it can be applied uniformly to all of the different resource types. Um, and so this idea of kind of having some systems for some resources and some for others, I think in order to get uh, as best a possible apples to apples comparison of the reliability contributions of the resources, you want to be measuring those reliability contributions in the same way. And so I'm not going to, you know, uh, get into the weeds of how our reliability model works, but broadly speaking, if you're going to have a marginal approach, you want to say, you know, what is the marginal impact of adding a little bit of this resource type on the amount of expected unserved energy we have or some other metric for um, reliability, loss of load hours or something like that. And you want to uh, make that measurement um, in such a way that, um, you know, uh, you are um, uh, uh, doing so in a way that it makes a comp the output is comparable for the different resource types. And uh, it's gonna be a challenge. Um, and uh, I, I look forward to, um, you know, working through that with others in, within the ISO and, and stakeholders in, in um, you know, the coming months and years um, to, to come to a sensible solution to that. Here's another kind of maybe generic question about the gas supply was, was it, uh, I mean, maybe you know, maybe you, you don't, was the gas supply to power generators sort of the most tight or most constrained this winter that it's ever been, um, uh, just in the scale of things? And I don't know, any, anything else you can say about concerns with that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know that I know the answer to that question. And if I did, I'm not sure I could share it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to be honest. Or if you can share if there uh, was a gas I, I, curtailment, do, do you know, or can you share if there were curtailments in gas generation? I, I, I'm almost positive I certainly couldn't comment on anything like that, um, okay. even if I did know. Um, <laughs> I will say that um, I think that, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's um, it has, I think it has been a tight, just looking at prices, you know, from what you can uh, glean from looking at, you know, the fuel uh, mix uh, in the month of January and for parts of February, for example, look at the clearing prices. Uh, you know, we had prices in, I think, above $300 per megawatt hour um, in, uh, earlier this week, which is pretty high. Um, uh, we haven't had any scarcity events, what we would call, you know, OP4 events, where we haven't had any reserve shortages. Um, so, you know, props to, um, to, to our operators for, for ensuring that that didn't um, that wasn't the case. Uh, I think we've noted publicly, our CEO has noted publicly that uh, it, we we had some pretty tight conditions though earlier this month on January 11th, where um, you know it was looking like we had some some uh, major generator outages. We um, we uh, we were concerned about um, what uh, we were going to be able to get from uh, from the New York ISO, given what their constraints on their system were. But we, we pulled through it. We pulled through it okay without without having any research shortages or, or any, any load shed. But um, I think uh, I think this is a uh, yeah. I mean the I know that uh, the ISO this is something the ISO is certainly very worried about, and I think the states are worried about it as well. And um, uh, it's on the it's on the top of everyone's mind. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of work being done within the ISO and, and with the states to um, to you know make sure that we can fulfill our reliability objectives. On a, a kind of maybe theoretical note, uh, I think you said your forward capacity market is three years out, kind of forward looking, and I uh, hope you're still with us. And so, okay, uh, the, you, the forward capacity market is kind of three years out. Is there kind of what are the, I don't know, trade-offs of a shorter or longer time period? You know, in some sense, why is it three years? Hmm. Good question. Um, the farther out, well, okay, there are definitely, there's definitely trade-offs. The closer you are to the, um, the delivery year, the better information you have about what the delivery year is going to look like, which has, you know, various advantages. Um, that said, um, you know, the farther out you get, um, 
uh, you know, maybe the, uh, the more time there is for resources to come online and, and things like that. Um, uh, I think the, um, you know, for the, for right now, I think the balance is good. The three-year balance is good. Okay. Uh, here's one on, I guess, imports question from, you know, come back for this example, because you uh, uh, mentioned that. Um, I'm just kind of kind of reading the, the question here. It's imports from Quebec to New England ISO are currently a single digit, I guess, percentage of total resource mix, as this person understands. Uh, he's saying the Quebec's excess supply beyond what it is supplying to its domestic partners and its total US clients equals 1.5 times what New England's needs are. This is quite, are there marginal prices and reliability too high to increase your purchases from them? I guess, or is Quebec Hydro or Quebec's prices too hard to increase their purchases? I guess it's implying they have more capacity to give and, and maybe why wouldn't uh, I assume New England have more? Uh, and maybe that's not your choice, it's somebody else's choice to, to buy it, but you can clarify. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, could you, I, I didn't, I missed, I think my connection might have given out there for just a second. Right, what, right. What's the, can you read? Right. I think the question is saying that uh, it seems as though Quebec and their hydropower maybe has a lot more capacity to give, but it seems like a small percentage mm -hmm. of ISO New England. So the questions are kind of like, maybe why is it not a higher percentage? What are the constraints? Is the price at which they're selling the hydro yeah. higher than what people think it should be? And I know there's discussions about transmission lines cutting through New England states, and so maybe that's the problem. But yeah, go ahead. I think that's the that's at the heart of it, um, you know, that equals um, the transmission. You're probably or... aware. Yeah, uh, okay. you're, the um, there were plans to build a pretty major transmission um, line from uh, Quebec down to um, you know the Boston area, and um, in in the in November the uh, I think Maine voters passed a proposition which is I think it for them it it. Well, the proposition effectively killed the project, and that is still being worked out in the courts. And how that will settle out is um, is an open question. And you know, um, uh, I won't comment on that further, other than to say I think the issue with getting the power is just got to have the transmission lines to get the power, because otherwise it's just congested, right? You can't get any more any more power. It, yeah, for the for the um, for the you know, electrical engineering nerds, I think our Big lines there are actually DC lines, um, direct current from uh, from Quebec down to, to the Boston area, whereas most of the U.S. grid is, um, uh, you know, alternating current. Yeah. Oh, All right. Maybe I'll, I'll Sorry. yeah. Maybe I'll finish with this one question, which I, I think you can't answer, but there might be something. Uh, there might be something you can say. Um, this, this this question is. Uh, the person referring to Wisconsin and saying, you know, that the uh, the idea that MISO, Mid-Continent ISO, is being controlled by the, the federal government in Washington and the state legislature wants some other, you know, relative control more than uh, what's coming from FERC or other places. Uh, so the question is, is this Wisconsin specific or are there similar political concerns in New England? I guess there's probably nothing to say on that, but maybe there is a way, something to say about just how the ISO operates in, in the context of you know, I don't know, political pressure or pressure on to do one thing versus another, and you've got different kinds of stakeholders. So maybe there's just, I don't know, we can enlighten that a little bit or how yeah. ISO operates. Yeah, I won't comment on um, on the, po the political side of anything. Um, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, the, you know, the, um, the sometimes there's differences um, and of opinion about things um, between the states that are part of us in New England and um, uh, you know, that's what, you know, some of that plays out in the stakeholder process. Um, uh, but uh, beyond that, I won't, um, you know. Yeah, no problem. <clears throat> okay, well, we'll end it there. So I thought it was a nice overview and a discussion of the challenges that ISO New England's facing uh, with the more renewables and the changing grid mix and natural gas constraints. There's all kinds of constraints getting up there. So glad you're on the, on the challenge. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for joining us, Stephen Otto, economist at uh, New England Independent System Operator. Thanks for joining us for the Energy Symposium. Thank you very much. All right.